All right, Jack. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, man. To so, you. where I want to start with is uh, there's a lot to talk about, but where I want to start with is well, the album is called Singing to Strangers. Yeah. And I think last uh, time we talked about poetry and, and where you got your start in a sense. But do you remember when you kind of realized that, that what you could sing to people could affect them in some emotional kind of way? I think I realized that pretty early on. I think that's what you realize while you get into this. I think I realized that with my mother probably more than anything. Um, I remember being in a, when I was in high school and I started getting into music. I was playing drums with all these school bands and friends of mine were playing guitar. And then we did poetry at school and I was kind of good at that. It was the first time I'd been good at something at school. And I remember coming home and writing a song and playing it to my mother. And she was the first person that probably ever heard one of my songs. And her reaction was quite overwhelming. Um, I mean, I don't know if there was tears involved, but maybe. But, you know, now I'm a dad. I'll probably have this, like, if my, my daughter, she, she, she makes up songs all the time. And, um, and we write songs together. But the day she comes up to me and says, I've written something by herself, I'll probably lose it as well. So I think the first time I felt that reaction was, was with my mother. And then through that, I tried it out with my friends. Um, and yeah, I guess, I guess that's what, that's what motivates you if you're in any creative field is connect. Not actually, that's not true. Not everybody. because I know a lot of artists who don't care about that at all, but I, I definitely do it for the connecting element. I definitely, um, find tremendous satisfaction and pleasure in that moment of playing something to somebody and then reacting. Right, so it's not just the creative element. Uh, I no. mean, that's part of it, but yeah, then yeah. it has to be shared in a sense. Totally. The creative element is actually driven by, I wonder how this is going to react. I don't care whether people like it. That's not usually my thought. Although, it's nicer when people like <laughs> sure. it than when they don't like it. But that's not my sort of people have to like this. Um, it's more about like, I really want somebody to notice something that I think they're not seeing. Um, a bit like a photographer. Like I want somebody to realize how beautiful that park bench is. And something that they use every day, I want them to realize, oh, but that's, that's, that's amazing. Oh, that's really sad. Don't you find that really sad when they're like, no, it's nothing. I'm like, no, but think about it this way. And sometimes with music, I think you can sort of, I guess, convince people easier. But that's an interesting thought because, and I, maybe this is true for, for, I suppose, poetry as well, but when you started writing songs, and, and like you say, looking at a park bench or just anything, did you start kind of looking at the world a little bit differently, observing it differently? Yeah, 100%. Um, I think that comes, that, that definitely comes easier when you travel mm. um, because I think when you travel, already your senses are a little bit more alive because you're out of your comfort zone, so you're a bit more aware and you start observing But I really noticed that once I started songwriting and once I started seeing also what people reacted to, um, the detail, people react to detail. I react to detail when I'm listening to a song. Um, it can be the small, like you can have a great song, but it'll be like one lyric. I'm trying to think of one right now, but um, there's Simon and Garfunkel. I think it's in America where he says, toss me a cigarette. I think there's one in my raincoat. It's just like a conversation, but it's that imagery of, Toss me a cigarette, I think there's one in my raincoat. It's not this great poetic line. It's not this great, but we've all had that moment of, you know, and, and that, that sort of brings you into this world. So I, I've always, I'm always looking for that detail, that little moment. Yeah. In, in that sense, then, do you consider yourself uh, more of a storyteller, in a way? I hope so. I hope songs, I, I, I'm attracted to music, music in general, not just mm -hmm. lyrics, for its storytelling purpose. Um, mm -hmm. Um, as well as emotive and mm. sensitor, sensory experience. I really like the actual um, the storytelling side to it. Um, so yeah, I think in every song I pretty I always try. And, and probably I used to do that more with the song. Now I try to do it with an album as mm. well because there's so many songs out there. <laughs> um, I think the only thing that I try to differentiate myself from everybody else is I really like to focus on the album. Um, I find that songs are like adverts. Whereas albums are like movies, um, and that's how I—that's kind of how I see it. When I'm not—not not how I see music in general, but when I'm creating, I like to think of my songs as little ingredients that make up a big dish. Kind and of the scenes, big dish. And exactly the... scenes out of a movie. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll get to the album uh, in a second because there's one one thing I'd like to ask because um, kind of what you mentioned about that Simon and Garfunkel line and. and 
one song of yours that had that kind of effect on me a little bit is, is uh, Broken Glass, where it's very descriptive. Mm. Uh, you can picture kind of... The scene. Yeah. The scene. It's like a crime scene, almost. <laughs> but, a, but, a good crime yeah, scene. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what I find interesting about it, and then kind of going into the, the album, I suppose, is, is, is there a certain cinematic quality that you have that, or that, that you are looking for in terms of kind of setting a tone, setting a, a, an atmosphere for, for the listener? Yeah, I mean, on this particular album, it's not by chance that mm. the opening song sounds like Candlelight and is called Candlelight. It's kind of that sort of, let's set the mood. What's the first thing you do when you're trying to set the mood? In my house, we like candles. <laughs> That's the first thing you set that, you change the atmosphere, you change the light. And that's what I want this song to be on the album. It's that moment where you sort of step out of your real life, light the candles, turn the lights down, and go into this world. So, so yeah, that's definitely a conscious decision, for sure. Was that one of the first songs that you kind of wrote for this, this album? Yeah, definitely. I don't know, it wasn't the first, um, but it was up there in the sort of first two or fourth. But it was the first one that really nailed the sound and the, the, the sort of sentiment and the, the whole... I had this idea in my head, I had a really clear, which I've never had before making an album. Usually I write a bunch of songs, go into the studio and let's see what happens. This time it was like, I had this sort of real, no, I want to make a really romantic album that um, triggers all the, the sort of inspirations that I grew up with um, and is a real sort of homage to sort of this kind of European style way of making albums that has kind of died out um, that, that, that I've always found very very interesting but I couldn't really describe it to people and if I did it was a bit pastiche and it was a bit we've tried it in the past I've, I've touched it in, in, in the past in previous albums Broken Glass actually was kind of at the beginning of trying to find that sound but I went into the studio with Joel Potts who used to be in a band called Athlete and we were talking, literally just face to face, and we were in the studio just talking about these sounds that I was desperately trying to get, the Saj Gansberg album called Melody Nelson, sure. which as a sonic reference, I was like, man, I'd love to make a record like that, but with different songs. And, and he suddenly said to me, something along the lines of this, and he played me a drum film. It was just a doo -doo 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 -doo, which is in candlelight. And it was a drum sound that I've been looking for my entire life. I was like, there it is. He understood exactly what I was going for. And we wrote Candlelight pretty much around this drum fill. Mm. And, um, and that was the sort of calling card of the album. That made me go to my label, to my band, to my team, and just say, this is what I'm doing. Are you with me? And everybody understood it. And it was great. So, yeah. Before we get into the sounds, because there, there are some very nice, uh, well, kind of what you yeah. mentioned with the ballad of Melody Nelson. It, it does yeah. make sense now that you say that. Um, but when, when you... I suppose artists, are, they always say art is a reflection of life. And we talked before about times when uh, your career wasn't going as you uh, wanted it to. And then as I planned, yeah. <laughs> certain, certain songs. Well, I didn't plan. That was the problem. <laughs> I just sort of was like, yeah, sure, let's see what happens. But <laughs> certain things, uh, I mean, certain songs and albums come out of uh, situations like that. Mm -hmm. So what made, and then I think uh, for the last two, three albums, you've been on, on, an, on that path. Yeah. And then you mentioned, I think last time as well, that you, you no longer really have expectations. You try to just uh, please yourself. And yeah, and enjoy go. the moment. Yeah. So what, what made that the idea of uh, kind of that romantic feeling? Is, is that just a reflection of where you are in yeah. this point in your life? Yeah, I think for sure. I think it's, I was very happy after the last record. I was quite satisfied with myself. <laughs> I was pretty like, okay, that, that worked out. We moved out of London. I moved into a lovely house in the countryside. I have two magnificent children, three dogs, my wife. Um, suddenly I was looking around and being like, okay, this is actually, life is wonderful. And that's when it sort of, and I did have a moment of like, now what the hell am I going to write about? <laughs> like everything I've written about is anger, uh, you know, me against the world, frustration mm -hmm. or, or drive or push, 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 you know. And suddenly I was like, I didn't feel like I'd arrived, but I definitely felt like I was home. Uh, and that's, I haven't felt that feeling for a long time. Um, so I think that was it. I got home. And that allowed me to really, I had a bit of a life is beautiful moment. Mm. Wow, life is beautiful. And I kind of was seeing a lot of friends of mine who were still fighting, still pushing. And I just felt like I want this, I wanted to make something that was a bit like a hand on the shoulder of these people. And it's like, keep going, don't worry. 
Like life, but, but life doesn't have to be like that. There is also a beautiful element to life. Don't get caught up in the rat race. Remember to look at things. Remember to talk to each other. Remember to look at each other. Remember to express yourself too, which is, I think, you know, a pretty, pretty uh, global epidemic happening for men, at least, we, especially a lot around the world, is not knowing or, or feeling that nobody's interested in what they have to feel or what they have to say. And I think it's about trying to tap into that emotional element of life and the sentimental aspect of life and, and to be okay with it and to find it beautiful and wonderful. Kind of the courage to be vulnerable. In this exactly, the courage to be vulnerable. This is a definitely an album, but not only courage, enjoy it. Mm. Like, don't even, that because I've definitely always affronted stuff, confronted, should I say, stuff, feeling like I'm doing it with a sword in hand and mm. courage and like it's me. But this time, you know, this wasn't sort of bare chest. This was more like, I am what I am, and I really am okay with it. And, you know, I know that sounds a little bit whatever, but that's, that's exactly what I, that, that's what I felt like doing with this album. I felt like being a stupid, romantic, you know, sentimental, melancholic fool. So can I, can I picture you then uh, when you're trying out these songs? Is it, are you serenading your wife? Is, is that how you... Serenading think? myself in the mirror. <laughs> Uh, no, my wife, my poor wife, my, my wife, she has to listen to me write these songs all day. So it's a typical scene in our house for me to run, you know, to my wife, Gemma, and say, do you want to hear my new song? And she's like, I've heard it for the last five days. You know, like, I'm good. I don't need to hear it anymore. And then she's always surprised when she hears it on a record. She goes, oh, I like this. And I'm like, I asked to play. She's like, yeah, but it's different now. Now there's all the band. It's, it's nice. So no, I don't go around serenading her and. No, I don't go around saying anything. But I bought a piano, mm. and that changed that changed a lot of things because I felt like I was actually trying to perform to the piano. You know, with a guitar, when you write, you're like this. Mm. You sort of hunch over. You're, it's like me. You're in your own world. Whereas a piano, you sort of fix yourself. You know, yeah, you sit up straight, and you're singing too. You're presenting something to it. And it's something that keeps giving you ideas. Whereas a guitar kind of gives you a... a, a a solid bass, but you sort of have to do everything else. Whereas a piano, you sort of move your hand and suddenly it gives you a melody, then it gives you a bass line, then it, it gives you so many different things. Mm. And um, I think, yeah, that changed the way I, I sang, changed the way I wrote melodies. I really focused on melodies with this album, whereas in the past I was more about rhythm and groove and whatever. But this, yeah, I think the piano had a big influence. Can I assume then um, that things I th uh, thought I'd never do was written on piano? Yeah, that was the second song I wrote for the album. The first two songs I wrote for the album were Going Home, mm. which is a real transition from sort of my old rootsy bluesy sort of thing. Mm. And it's again going back to that story I was saying, it's me realizing that I've come home. And then the second song I wrote, once I really got to, because it was a new piano, so the first one is a bit going home, it's a bit honky tonky and like bluesy and messy. And then suddenly I sort of learned, to, it was like getting a wild horse. You know, the first one she was all, and then the second one, once I calmed the horse down, which was this piano, I wrote things I thought I'd never do. And then there's, there's this saying, and it's more aimed at media, but it, it's, it's called uh, the medium is the message. So in, in a sense, using piano, like you say, and then being influenced then by other melodies, did that kind of set the tone for that song? Did it, did it become a little bit more melancholic because of... Uh... 100%. My piano is very melancholic. It sounds like a drunk old man, like just the sound of my piano at home. It's not a... It's, it was 400 pounds. It's, somebody was getting rid of it. It's not a, it's not a Steinway in sound. It's not a Yamaha. It's, I don't even know what it's called. It's called like Phillips or something, Johnson or something like... It's something really... Um, and it's a drunk old man. And it definitely helped take me to this kind of intimate romantic a little bit dark you know there's always a bit of darkness there mm. if you go looking there's always a bit of darkness um, if you go be beneath the surface of anything there's always and and this piano definitely takes you beneath the superficial um and uh yeah things i thought i'd never do is probably one of the most honest moments moments of my life forget about songs mm. um and i remember even when writing it i was like why are you saying this <laughs> why are you not stopping Like, what's coming out? And then I realized it wasn't really about me. It's about everybody has things they thought they'd never do. Mm. You know, whether you killed somebody or whether you cheated on somebody or whether you parked <laughs> in the wrong space, <laughs> stole somebody, you know, like everybody's got regrets. Everybody's got remorse. Everybody's got that one thing they just never thought they would do. 
some of us have more than others, but everybody's got one. So it started being a song about that. But this makes me think of something then, because as a songwriter, is, is it kind of you surrendering yourself to mm -hmm. those ideas? And, and because uh, I can imagine so when, when you're especially delving into yourself and it can get quite dark that you think, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. But do you have to kind of surrender to it and just let it go? Yeah, music is like this little charmer, you know, it's the snake charmer. <laughs> And it's the same way with your feelings, you know. Mm. You're like, I would never say, do, do, do. Okay, I'll say it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's time. So, yeah, you're, you're charmed by music. And mm. that's why music is such a powerful thing because it does drag honesty out of your gut. You know mm. what I mean? It digs in and says, come on. And then somehow people accept it. People are okay with it. Whereas if I said most of the things I say in my songs or some songs in general out there, if somebody said that in a conversation, you would not tolerate that. Or you'd be like, wow, you're a real asshole. But if somebody sings it, you're like, well, <laughs> you know, I guess he, he means it. Or, you know, you find it. So there, it has this magic thing of protecting you as well. As well as digging inside your soul and getting the truth out, it also then seems to cocoon it because it takes it for itself. Mm. And people usually take it onto themselves when they listen to songs. I don't think people listen to my songs and go, I wonder if Jack was going through that. There might occasionally be an element like that when they, but I think, and I hope, is that what most people do. You know, when I listen to Bob Dylan, I don't really think about Bob Dylan. I think what it means to me. Mm. So people take it for their own. And, and so coming back then to that title, Singing for Strangers, uh, Singing to Strangers, that, that's kind of the, the interaction then that Absolutely. you're looking for. Yeah. You mentioned Bob Dylan. Now, uh, <laughs> that was a good. That was <laughs> yeah. good. I didn't do that deliberately, but that was. No, a good. But, but, but we were gonna go there anyway. <laughs> we were so going so there. Yeah. Um, I did, yeah, I just have to mention it because he, he's one of my. How the hell my did that happen? Yeah, no, because yeah. I, I, you described kind of uh, receiving that message and then your wife saying, "Don't fuck this." Don't fuck yeah. This yeah. But what? I, yeah. How did it? How did you get that email in the first place? It came through, it's really not a very romantic story. <laughs> I would love to say, you know, we met on a train, you know, mm. on our way to New Orleans. No, that didn't happen. Um, it was through American management. I was supposed to write with an incredible songwriter called Steve Earle, mm. who's another I sort of, yeah. yeah. Sure. And it kind of fell through last minute. But I think Steve's manager and Bob's manager are the same. I think mm. they're managed by the same company or the same people or something something along those lines. Anyway, my American management was sort of talking to them and saying, you know, shame we're going to make this happen. And they said, yeah, it is a shame, but listen, to make up for it or something, I don't know, they were like, we've actually got this, uh, we found this suitcase in the office with a bunch of lyrics of Bob's from the 90s that he never used. Would Jack be willing to look at them? Was sort of the conversation I had. So I get this phone call, I'm like, yeah, of course, I'd love to see them, just to see them. Right. I'd love to see what these lyrics are. But I thought, this is not, whatever, that's just them being sweet, being polite, saying, sorry, this didn't happen. Instead, three days later, I get an email from all these things with Bob in the keychain, and it's just, there's two poems. I call them poems, because they're not songs, they were mm. poems. Two poems just signed Bob. And I was like, is this legit? Is this for real? And they're like, yeah, this is, this is from Bob. He sent these two over. I don't know how, how it all came about. Um, I don't know if he has any idea this mm. has happened. Mm. I've never spoken to him, never nothing, just we're pen pals of poetry. Um, and then, yeah, I was really excited until I saw my wife's face expression and she just looked at me like, ah, oh, don't mess this up, man. Like, this is, you're going to be the guy that makes a really crap Bob Dylan song, aren't you? Which it still might be, I don't know. But I sat down with my guitar for a few hours and it was really frustrating because mm. he writes like Bob Dylan. Mm. <laughs> he is Bob Dylan. <laughs> and um, everything you do sounds like Bob Dylan. Mm. And I just thought, this is, what's the point of this? Like, maybe I won't do this. This is silly. I mean... It's just me playing it, but this is a Bob Dylan song. It's obvious it's a Bob Dylan song. So I put my guitar down, and actually I just, my, again, my wife was like, just, just make it one of your own. Pretend like it's not his. Like, don't stop singing. Mm. So I sat at the piano, and I was, the song is called Touchy Situation. And I was just sort of reading the lyrics, and I just sort of went, it's a touchy. And I went like that, like, mm. it's touchy. That's the lyric. And suddenly I was like, oh, there's an idea for the this chorus suddenly mm. came. It's a touchy situation. And he doesn't write choruses. He writes verse, and then there's always like a catchphrase at the mm. end. He doesn't really write verse, chorus, middle A. He doesn't do the, with the structure that I like to use. Um, so I just started moving all of his words around, and suddenly it turned, it felt like my own song. And even when I was singing, it felt like mine. And I was like, oh, okay. Mm. He's got the words, but this is my song. Um, and then I sent it to my people. My people sent it to his people. <laughs> we got the thumbs up. Okay. And now I get to have 
song song Jacks Have Ready, Bob Dylan on my record, which is the coolest thing ever. Well, I was going to say, because especially, um, I'm not sure how much you've been influenced by Bob Dylan, but as a songwriter, yeah, I suppose loads. everybody is. So. Anybody who's ever tried to write a song. So yeah. that must have been a surreal thing, kind of knowing his music uh, from when you were young and then kind of having that immediate connection with him. And again, he's a stranger to you, so... Yeah, he's still a stranger. I'm still singing to him as a stranger. He's the first concert I ever went to. The okay. first show I ever went to was Bob Dylan in Zurich, uh, okay. my high school sweetheart. Uh, took me to this show. I was about 16 or 17, 16, I think. And it was a hockey stadium in Zurich, and it was like half empty. And I, I walked in and I was waiting for you know Bob Dylan. I had posters of him. I'd seen all the movies. I'd seen all the, the documentaries. And um, this little guy walks on stage. And I remember just thinking, that's Bob Dylan. And they were like, yeah, that's Bob Dylan. And I was like, he's just a guy. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's Bob Dylan. And I was like, oh. And I think that was definitely a realization I had where I want to do that. <laughs> if he can do it, I can do it. I mean, I, I know that sounds weird because Bob Dylan is a genius, but it was seeing the physical aspect of him rather than the art. Just seeing the guy made me think that maybe anybody can be a genius. <laughs> it, but it, I, I do get what you're saying because it makes it less mythical. In exactly. Sense. You just exactly. see art. It's just another guy and just who another happens guy. to be brilliant at songwriting. Who happens to be brilliant at songwriting. Exactly. That's exactly how I felt. So I was like, okay. That looks like a pretty cool job. Mm. Yeah. And here we are. Here we are today. <laughs> the, still, I'm still not Bob Dylan, but no, at least the, I wrote a song with him. I stole his word. <laughs> <laughs> then finally, I, I want to get into the, some of the sounds a little bit more, because one thing I think uh, that the album does really well is, is kind of all those, those little sounds in between. And I don't know how much they get fleshed out uh, by you beforehand or in the studio. But for instance, um, on the song, what more can I do? Kind of the, the way the song starts with the strings. I do, think do, 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 do. <laughs> those kind of elements that, that again, a cinematic quality to yeah. that. So, so what was kind of your your um, approach in, in getting kind of that sound? So there's so many reasons why that happened. They were all deliberate. There is there isn't a sound on this album that wasn't like celebrated by everybody in the studio. <laughs> we went in there looking to really have fun with this. Um, we were very fortunate. I was very fortunate for many reasons. But there's three names in particular. Uh, Davide Rossi, who did all the string arrangement and actually wrote, I wrote some of the songs with him to his string arrangements, which is something I've never done before. He would send me a string arrangement, like a sort of idea, and then I wrote a song over the strings. Mm -hmm. What more can I do is that, mm -hmm. um, which is why it's such a melodic, da, 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 that's a string part, mm -hmm. and I put words to that. Um, and then Cam Blackwood, uh, the producer, is an absolute genius and phenomenon when it comes to not letting anything get wasted he's a bit like that guy that when you go into a kitchen and you think you're done with the cooking he goes what about all this stuff and you say no we throw that away he goes no and then he sort of makes a whole new meal out of what you were going to throw away he does that with sound like everything you're like eh, he turns into like essential parts of of a, of a, of a, of a sound and then I had Nikolai Torp uh, who's my um, musical director throughout this who musical MD the, the whole the whole album and so the combination of these sort of three wizards mm. um and that's how i would describe them as wizards kind of getting together and mixing it all up yeah it was great fun also the studio sorry actually there's a fourth the studio we were in Enya morricone studio is filled with these amazing drums tubular bells old pianos so yeah well because i was gonna go uh, there as well kind of that must have played a role. I mean, being yeah, being uh, in Rome, part of your heritage, and then being in, in kind of one of the most iconic uh, studios. Yeah, it was incredible. And like you can hear at the end of Candlelight, there's the dong, which is the classic. Mm -hmm. You know, Morricone has used that in, you know, in all of his famous spaghetti western soundtracks. <laughs> um, there's a piano that he used for Once Upon a Time in the West, which we actually did the intro. There's a song on here called um, uh, Greatest Mistake. Um, and the intro of Greatest Mistake is done on this on a Celeste and on a Glockenspiel piano. Mm. And these two very little pianos, they're both about that wide. And Nikolai Torp actually is playing both the harmonies at the same time on these two different pianos. And it sounds incredible. But that was a mm. that's the kind of stuff that had we been not been in that studio, we never would have got that sound. So finally then because of the product, I mean, you used to, uh, previous albums have been very much acoustic and, mm. and uh, now it's a, it's a very full sound. So mm. thinking about live shows, um, 
how are you going to approach the live? Is it difficult to rep replicate kind of what you did in the studio in a, in a live show? No, it's not difficult because it's my band playing. Okay. Like, and it was all done live. Uh, mm. These are all okay. one take takes. Okay. Um, sort of, we've added stuff afterwards, but the drums, guitar, piano, bass, that's all in one take. Uh, we sort of did about five takes per song and then chose our favorite take. Um, so no, I mean, the hardest part is the strings. That's the thing. I am taking an incredible violin player with me, um, but we're going to have to figure out a way to sort of make the sound a bit more lush and play a bit with some different sort of effects and things like that. Um, but no, I just want it to be quite theatrical live because it is a very theatrical album. Right. I'm not playing any instruments on this album except for Singing to Strangers, right. which was a song I wrote at, when the album was done. The album was called Singing to Strangers because that, that was the, I, I had that title like a year ago and I really wanted that. It was a conversation I heard um, and I think it was my daughter who said, it, somebody was asking what her dad does and she goes, he goes around the world singing to strangers. And I was like, well, I do a bit more. Actually, no, that's pretty much what I do. Like I'm trying to defend it, but she was, that was it. I go around the world singing to strangers. And I thought, great, I'm going to make an album called Singing to Strangers. Um, and then just before the album was done, I thought, it'd be really great to have a song explaining mm. this. Uh, so me and my guitar player, Pedro Vito, we sort of came up with this. It's very old me, mm. sort of, you yeah. know. I went back and I wanted it to be like that. And I wanted it to be just me and the guitar. So you're kind of seeing in this movie, let's call it, in this album, the evolution of the guy standing alone on stage, singing to strangers, turning into what more can I do in candlelight and string arrangements, <laughs> that sort of whole journey. Um, so that's the only song where I'm playing an instrument, which is why the album sounds so good, because <laughs> I'm not playing on it. But then, to, kind of to end, that, that's, um, that's then kind of, uh, the essence has always remained the same, which is, and I wrote that line, and all I can do is try my best to entertain. Exactly. That's, that's kind of fundamentally what, it's a brutal reality. Mm. Some artists don't want to admit that. They think they have a greater calling, but at the end of the day, we're here to entertain um, and connect, and, mm. and that's... And also, there's a massive element of ego, which is even in the songs, what have I got to do to prove to you that I'm not a failure? Mm. There's also that. So it's not just take, 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 take. We're not there <laughs> doing charity. We're there also saying, but give me, give me a reason, give me some reassurance, give me some, you know, make me realize that I'm not crazy for doing this. <laughs> I think that's a good way to end it. Jack, thank you very <laughs> thank much. Thank you so time. much, man. Thank right, you. Man. Thank Cheers, you. man. Thank you. That was great.